I really need to thank these people, you know, for putting in this legwork in terms of going to the trouble of explaining this. Because, you know, those of us who come from a fundamentalist background, we just take it as a given that the Bible is historically accurate. We just assume that to be the case. And how are we to know any different if there are if there is no Bible scholarship, if there are no people who are willing to devote decades and decades, their entire careers, to examining the documents, to examining the archaeological evidence, to getting their hands dirty, sifting through rubble and finding inscriptions. How are we to know any different if not for the efforts of these incredible people? Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. In this video, I am going to be discussing some historical inaccuracies in the Bible. Now, I realize this is quite a contentious topic, especially for many of you watching who are believers in the Bible as God's inerrant word. I do, however, need to get a little bit of admin and housekeeping out of the way first. I know exactly what's going to happen. There will be comments below complaining that I'm not launching straight into my list of examples. All you need to do, and I'm going to get complaints no matter what happens, <laughs> all you need to do is go to the video description and look at the chapters. And if you want to just skip all of the intro and go straight to the examples, that option is available to you. However, Let's do things properly. I do need to say a few things before we begin. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members for voting for me to do this video. So this channel is supported by hundreds of patrons and YouTube channel members. And every month we hold a vote as to what topic they want me to discuss on the channel and this particular topic was actually voted for last month so I must thank them for forcing me to get out my books, get out my pen and paper and do research on this very important and fascinating subject. I also want to mention that I am not going to be using the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation Bible in this video for reasons that you will understand if you watch my doctored series thumbnail to the first in that series here. Basically the Jehovah's Witness Bible isn't to be trusted. <laughs> I think we can safely conclude. So I'm going to be quoting um, just in one or two places from the English Standard Version. Look, I'm going to be going through eight examples in total and I'm going to be drawing from the quotes and conclusions of five Bible scholars. There are actually three main sources that I'm going to be consulting, purely because these are the best books that I own <laughs> on Bible scholarship. So we have God and Anatomy by Francesca Stavrakopoulou. We have the Bible Unearthed by Israel Finkelstein. I've discussed this book many, many times over the years on this channel. And we're going to be discussing or quoting from A History of the Bible, the book and its faiths by John Barton. And this is actually quite significant because John Barton... Um, is obviously a Bible scholar, but he's also a Christian. He's actually an Anglican minister. So I don't want it to be kind of accused that I am leaning purely on atheist Bible scholars. The conclusions that I am going to be referring to are basically the scholarly consensus. 
and they are shared even by the likes of John Barton. So I wanted to make that clear from the outset. Again, those three books will be heavily referred to, particularly for the first six examples. And then for examples seven and eight, I'm going to be showing some video footage of a further two scholars, namely Dr. Richard Carrier and Dr. Bart Ehrman. Now, finally, before we get into the examples, I want to address the question, why is this relevant? Because I can imagine many watching, particularly those who profess to be Christian, I can imagine them saying, look, Lloyd, no one thinks of the Bible as an exhaustive history book. You know, it's going to get things a little bit wrong now and then. The point of the Bible is not that it's chronicling human history. The point of the Bible is that it is conveying God's wisdom to us. And to be completely honest, I find that reasoning rather disingenuous. It's a little bit like when I did my scientific inaccuracies video, thumbnail here. Inevitably, you get people commenting, the Bible doesn't set out to be a book of science. It's an unfair thing to assume that the Bible should be correct when it's commenting on matters of science. But by the same token, you can just imagine if the Bible, let's say hypothetically, if the Bible were correct in everything it said about science, the same people who are defending it would be saying, well, this is proof <laughs> that it's God's inspired word. Because whenever it does talk about science, it's getting it absolutely spot on. And I can imagine it being exactly the same with history, with historical matters. If the Bible were 100% correct, whenever it touched on human history, Middle Eastern history, what have you, defenders of the Bible would be saying, well, this is exactly what we should be expecting from God's inerrant word. The point is, it isn't an inerrant word. It's full of errors. And this is exactly what you would expect from a man-made document dating to the late Bronze Age. And frankly, it, none of these things would matter. The scientific inaccuracies wouldn't matter. And the historical inaccuracies wouldn't matter if people didn't place so much power in the Bible, power to decide what sort of relationships they should have, what sort of things they should eat, how they should dress themselves, all of these things. And so many religious authority figures or religious organizations use the Bible as a mandate for them to rule over people's lives in this way. So I agree, it shouldn't be a surprise <laughs> that the Bible has mistakes in it. It's just that the question of whether there are mistakes becomes ever more pressing and ever more relevant when you think about how the Bible is used and how much control and power is wielded over people's lives in the Bible's name. So with all of those disclaimers and all of that admin out of the way, let's launch straight into our first example, the patriarchs and earlier. I've had to make this an extremely broad topic because the truth of the matter is, you know, when it comes to events described in the Bible, such as the Garden of Eden and Noah's flood, it's quite hard to find scholarly books that even begin to approach these events as though they are events that people would assume were true. In other words, it's just so glaringly obvious that the Garden of Eden story is a myth and that the Noah's Flood story is a myth that no serious scholar is going to devote paragraphs or even sentences to making that argument because it's just a, taken as a given. But having said that, the books that I am quoting from, all three of them have the following to say 
about the period of the patriarchs and earlier. We'll start off with A History of the Bible by Dr. John Barton. Many readers of the Bible would recognize that the stories of the early history of the world, Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, are mythical or legendary. But it may be more challenging to think that the stories of Abraham or Jacob or Moses are also essentially legends, even though people bearing those names may well have existed. No one is in a position to say they are definitely untrue, but there is no reasonable evidence that would substantiate them. So let me just remind you that th this is an Anglican priest saying this. There is no reasonable evidence that would substantiate the stories of Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and certainly not Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, the Garden of Eden, etc. So we move on to God and Anatomy by Dr. Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Historically, only the later episodes of this biblical story broadly dovetail with known realities, at best consigning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and even David and Solomon to the realms of fable, and at worst to sheer fantasy. From the 9th century BCE onwards, archaeological evidence points to the existence of the separate Iron Age kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and corroborates the names of some of their kings. But non-biblical material can also flag the limitations of the Bible's portrayal of the past, warning us that it cannot be taken as a comprehensive or reliable record of history. So that's the assessment of another Bible scholar, Dr. Francesca Stavragopoulou. We move on to The Bible Unearthed, Dr. Israel Finkelstein, assisted by Neil Asher Silberman. Much of what is commonly taken for granted as accurate history, the stories of the patriarchs, the exodus, the conquest of Canaan, and even the saga of the glorious united monarchy of David and Solomon, are rather the creative expressions of a powerful religious reform movement that flourished in the kingdom of Judah in the late Iron Age. Although these stories may have been based on certain historical kernels, they primarily reflect the ideology and the worldview of the writers. Which I think is the most polite way of saying, don't look at these stories as historical fact, look at them as a means of getting across an ideology and worldview. So that's the patriarchs and earlier... I may revisit certain parts of this period in future videos. In fact, it was precisely because there was so much information in these books when I was researching that I realized I can't do all of this in one video. I'm going to have to do it in parts. So this is part one. Hopefully there will be a part two, maybe even a part three. Who knows? Next example, the exodus from Egypt and the book that really deals with this, of the three that I'm referring to, is the Bible unearthed. There's quite a long quote that I need to read you, so bear with me. The Manapta Stel refers to Israel as a group of people already living in Canaan, but we have no clue, not even a single word, about early Israelites in Egypt, neither in monumental inscriptions on walls of temples, nor in tomb inscriptions, nor in papyri. Israel is absent as a possible foe of Egypt, as a friend, or as an enslaved nation, and there are simply no finds in Egypt that can be directly associated with the notion of a distinct foreign ethnic group, as opposed to a concentration of migrant workers from many places, living in a distinct area of the eastern delta, as implied by the biblical account of the children of Israel living together in the land of Goshen, referring to Genesis 47 verse 27. According to the biblical account, the children of Israel wandered in the desert and mountains of the Sinai Peninsula, moving around and camping in different places for a full 40 years. 
even if the number of fleeing Israelites, given in the text as 600,000, is wildly exaggerated or can be interpreted as representing smaller units of people, the text describes the survival of a great number of people under the most challenging conditions. Some archaeological traces of their generation-long wandering in the Sinai should be apparent. However, except for the Egyptian forts along the northern coast, not a single campsite or sign of occupation from the time of Ramesses II and his immediate predecessors and successors has ever been identified in Sinai, and it has not been for lack of trying. So, pretty damning assessment there regarding the historicity of the exodus from Egypt, which is, you could say, a a central story, certainly in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible. And yet, even though archaeologists have scoured the Sinai Peninsula, they haven't been able to find so much as a toothpick in terms of any evidence of there being encampments or any evidence of such a huge group of people wandering across the Sinai over such a long period of time when they would by necessity need to be leaving behind some evidence that they were there. So anyway, that's the exodus from Egypt. Moving on, we come to Joshua's conquest of the Promised Land and we start off with a history of the Bible, Dr. John Barton. Whereas the book of Joshua gives the impression that the Israelites conquered the Promised Land through a series of battles with the native Canaanites, excavations of early Israelite settlements reveal no break in population in the relevant periods. The population expanded, but there is no evidence of widespread destruction, and the crucial markers of identity such as pottery types continue uninterrupted. From this it seems that any incomers were few and far between. And returning to The Bible Unearthed by Dr. Israel Finkelstein, as with the Exodus story, archaeology has uncovered a dramatic discrepancy between the Bible and the situation within Canaan at the suggested date of the conquest, between 1230 and 1220 BCE. Although we know that a group named Israel was already present somewhere in Canaan by 1207 BCE, the evidence on the general political and military landscape of Canaan suggests that a lightning invasion by this group would have been impractical and unlikely in the extreme. That's on page 76 of the book. I'm going to move forward a couple of pages to pages 78 and 79, archaeology has uncovered dramatic evidence of the extent of Egyptian presence in Canaan itself. It is highly unlikely that the Egyptian garrisons throughout the country would have remained on the sidelines as a group of refugees from Egypt wreaked havoc throughout the province of Canaan and it is inconceivable that the destruction of so many loyal vassal cities by the invaders would have left absolutely no trace in the extensive records of the Egyptian empire. And I think it's worth noting at this point, um, I, I continue to marvel at this work by Dr. Israel Finkelstein, and not all of it has sunk in. I, I still have to reread certain parts um, such as my ability to absorb information or my limited ability to absorb information. One of the things that really hit me when I was first reading this book was that, you know, even assuming the Exodus story to be true, you have this situation where a group of people moves not from Egypt to Canaan, but from Egypt to another part of Egypt, because as Dr. Finkelstein alludes to there, Canaan was a province of Egypt at that point. So there were Egyptian garrisons throughout Canaan. 
it was under Egyptian control, the cities of Canaan were vassal cities. They had to pay tribute to the Egyptians. And that's something that you never even consider when you're actually reading the account as a believer. You just assume, oh, they left Egypt and then they went into the desert and then there were these foreign cities that were just ripe for invasion um, that had nothing to do with the country that they'd left behind. Well, that's not actually the case, at least as far as archaeology is concerned. So we move on to David and Solomon's empire. Uh, John Barton, in A History of the Bible, says, David and Solomon, who are said to have established a huge empire, have left almost no traces that archaeologists can examine and receive no mention in the records of other nations in the region. That's pretty damning, especially when you consider the next point on this list. I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but it relates to a ruler briefly described in the Bible who was extensively documented by neighbouring countries, and yet these two heroes of the Bible, David and Solomon, there's almost nothing about them. In fact, really the only piece of evidence that you can point to in support of David is, I'm going to show you this inscription. It's called the Tel Dan inscription dating to the 9th century BCE. It was actually found in 1993 and it's a slab, a basalt slab that had actually been broken. It had been relocated. It had been used um, basically as like the foundations of a later building. So someone had just broken it up, probably not realizing its significance at some point in antiquity. And so as a result, it's fragmentary and you kind of have to guess what large parts of it are saying. But at least part of it refers specifically to so-and-so of the house of David. So the inscription proves that in the 9th century BCE there was such a thing as the house of David. And that's it. That's pretty much what we've got in establishing the dynasties of David and Solomon. And also commenting on this... Uh, in the Bible Unearthed, Dr. Israel Finkelstein says, For some years, Solomon's gates, and I'm inserting here at Megiddo, that's what he's referring to, symbolized archaeology's most impressive support for the Bible, yet basic questions of historical logic eventually undermined their significance. As it turned out, we now know that the archaeological evidence for the vast extent of Davidic conquests and the grandeur of the Solomonic kingdom came as the result of badly mistaken dates. So, interestingly, there, there were these complexes uncovered at Megiddo, you know, far to the north of Jerusalem, and they were leapt on as evidence of Solomon's empire. Well, the, you know, these were his stables. There were, there were you know, because Solomon was supposed to have loads of horses and he'd need somewhere to keep them. So, you know, these are obviously some of the stables for his horses and these are the gates. He'd established like a military presence at Megiddo, but the more they analysed the site, the more they examined the architecture and the period that the architecture would have been from, they realised that they just completely made a mistake with dating it. There was no way it could have gone as far back as the time when Solomon was supposed to be ruling. To what extent can we call this a, a historical inaccuracy? Well, again, we, we, we can't completely rule out the possibility that there was a David and Solomon. It's just that it's unfathomable to think that they would that they would have amassed the empire and the wealth and the prestige that's described in the Bible. Remember the story of the Queen of Sheba traveling 
to visit Solomon because he was basically the OG. He was the he was the one that all of the world's rulers were looking up to. He had just this immense wealth and this immense empire. And yet somehow none of this gets recorded in any of the neighboring lands and there's no archaeological evidence of it. So if we're just being brutally honest, we just have to assume that it was all exaggerated. All of those stories about David and Solomon were exaggerated and therefore essentially historical inaccuracies. Now we come to our next example and it is that of Omri or Omri, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. I think I'll go with Omri. So who was Omri? Well, let's consult the Bible, shall we? Again, we're using the English Standard Version. We're looking at 1 Kings 16, verses 21 to 27. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terza. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shema for two talents of silver, and he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria after the name of Shema, the owner of the hill. Umri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Omri that he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his place. That is pretty much all the Bible has to say about Omri. His name does pop up in other books of the Bible, but only fleetingly, only as a fleeting reference, as in so-and-so of the house of Omri, or a son of Omri. With all of this in mind, let's consult again the a History of the Bible by Dr. John Barton. It is really only for the 9th and 8th centuries BCE that we have information in the Bible that can be substantiated from external records. I think just that point alone is just worth pa pausing on for a moment. It is really only for the 9th and 8th centuries BCE that we have information in the Bible that can be substantiated from external records. And this is, again, an Anglican minister. This is someone professing to be a Christian. And this is his assessment of the historicity of the Bible and how little of it, how, how little of the Bible dovetails, to use the word that Francesca Stavrakopoulou used, how little of it dovetails with the actual archaeological evidence. Anyway, we'll continue with the quote. Here the evidence shows the biblical account to be biased, but probably in touch with historical reality. The Assyrians record their relations with the northern kingdom of Israel, which they refer to as the House of Omri. According to 1 Kings 16, Omri was a relatively unimportant king whose reign of 12 years was characterized chiefly by his disobedience to the God of Israel and his worship of foreign gods, a standard accusation against the kings of the north. But the Assyrian annals show that Omri was an important and powerful ruler. Even into the 8th century, the title House of Omri continues as the name for Israel. The northern kingdom under Amri was prosperous and independent, 
and probably considerably more powerful than Judah, its poorer southern neighbor. So let's just think about that in the context of what we were saying about David and Solomon and how little evidence there is to support the grandiose claims that were made about the, the scope and magnitude of their dynasty. Nothing, nothing in the records, in the inscriptions, in the temples, in any of the documents of neighboring countries about this huge, wealthy empire that they presided over. But when it comes to Omri, who gets the most fleeting of mentions in the Bible, he is extensively referred to. You know, he was, like it or not, he was respected, for better or worse, as being essentially the man, the ruler of Israel. He was referred to over the course of centuries, in, at least in terms of his successors being referred to as um, part of the house of Omri. So this is quite interesting, and Francesca Stavrakopoulou has similar thoughts in her book, God and Anatomy. In the Book of Kings, for example, a 9th century BC ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel named Omri is presented as a figure of marginal significance, whose only noteworthy accomplishment is the founding of a new capital city, Samaria. But an inscribed stella set up by Mesha, king of neighbouring Moab, celebrates the regaining of sizable Moabite territories from Omri, king of Israel, and his successor, both of whom had oppressed Moab for a long time. The longevity of Omri's territorial and dynastic legacy is also reflected in Assyrian texts of the 9th and 8th centuries BCE, in which the kingdom of Israel is frequently designated Omri land, and its various kings as sons of Omri. The possibility that the Judahite writer of the Book of Kings has not only minimized but suppressed Omri's significance is signaled by an oblique fleeting reference to the rest of the acts of Omri and the power that he showed. So that's the assessment of Francesca Stavrakopoulou pointing out really that in order for the Bible to be taken seriously as any kind of historical document, it really needs to be unbiased. It really needs to be portraying history fairly and accurately. And here we have this ruler of Israel, who it turns out was kind of a big deal and was referred to in the inscriptions and writings of various neighboring countries and yet when it comes to the Bible, he gets, again, the most fleeting of references. Oh, he founded Samaria. He was kind of a bad guy. What more do we need to say? <laughs> now, if we're being fair, if we're being very precise, I guess you could say that this isn't technically a historical inaccuracy. Because at least the Bible acknowledges Omri. It's not like Omri's existence is completely negated or or wiped from the pages of the Bible. However, it does raise question marks over the credibility of the Bible writers in their ability to fairly and accurately and without any bias summarize the events that the Bible narrative is supposed to cover. And that's why I've included it in the list. So we now move on to actually a Bible verse in Deuteronomy 12 verses 4 to 7. And just to be clear, I'm reading this verse to make the point that the Bible extensively refers to Jerusalem as the only legitimate place for worship. Obviously, specifically the temple in Jerusalem that was the one and only place where Yahweh worship could legitimately be performed. I'm now going to read two verses that demonstrate this, but I think I'm 
explaining the obvious to those of you who are familiar with the Bible, but let's just be thorough here. Deuteronomy 12, 4 to 7 from the English Standard Version. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. And if we refer to another Bible verse, Second Chronicles 7, verses 11 and 12, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So very clearly and unambiguously, the Bible refers to the temple in Jerusalem as constructed by Solomon, allegedly, as being the exclusive place for Yahweh worship. And yet, interestingly, when you examine the, the books of Bible scholars and the findings of archaeology, it quickly becomes clear that that's just not the reality. That wasn't the reality on the ground for the Israelites. So in God and Anatomy, Francesca Stavrakopoulou says, the partisan perspectives of the Bible writers and editors are also evident in an overarching insistence that the Jerusalem temple served as the only legitimate site of Yahweh worship. Other ritual sites are downplayed as mere shrines or disparagingly dismissed as idolatrous and are said to have been closed down by especially virtuous kings of Judah. And yet archaeological evidence corroborates the existence of several Yahweh temples throughout the first millennium BCE, including one in a state-sponsored fortress in Arad on Judah's southern border, dated to the 8th century BCE, another built by Judahite immigrants on the Egyptian island of Elephantine in the 5th century BCE, and yet another operating from the 5th to the 2nd centuries BCE on Mount Gerizim in the West Bank. Scholars are agreed that the religious realities of Yahweh worship were far more diverse and far less centralised than the biblical story asserts. So that is an inaccuracy. You know, it's it's just simply not true when we examine the archaeological evidence that the Israelites were only able to worship or were only worshipping Yahweh or Jehovah, whatever you want to call him, at the temple in Jerusalem because multiple temples have been found in multiple other locations that were in operation in some cases for centuries. And more or less concurring with this is Dr. Israel Finkelstein in The Bible Unearthed. As described in 2 Kings 18 verses 3 to 7, the ultimate goal of Hezekiah's reform was the establishment of the exclusive worship of Yahweh in the only legitimate place for that worship, the Temple of Jerusalem. But Hezekiah's religious reforms are difficult to detect in the archaeological record. The evidence found for them, especially at two sites in the south, Arad and Beersheba, is disputed. So, I'm calling that an inaccuracy. I'm sorry, I just think there's an opportunity for the writers of the Bible to be open about the fact that there, there were actually multiple temples and multiple places where the Israelites would go and worship their God. But instead they give us this false narrative 
that there was actually only one legitimate place, the temple in Jerusalem, when archaeology demonstrates that to not have been the case. So we've made it through six of our eight examples. And for our remaining two examples, I'm going to leave behind my book collection and I'm going to revert to video clips because it's just easier and I also think it's a neat way of bringing in other Bible scholars so that I'm not just making this video on the backs of three individuals. I'm bringing in two more Bible scholars to, to demonstrate that the Bible isn't historically accurate. We begin on the topic of Daniel. Many of you will remember that I interviewed Dr. Richard Carrier regarding the historicity of the book of Daniel. Interestingly, I will just read briefly from um, John Barton's A History of the Bible. He says, The book of Daniel, for example, was certainly written no earlier than the 2nd century BCE. But Daniel himself is presented as living at the time of the exile. And I've put there in brackets in the 6th century BCE. You know, just a few brief words that immediately raise question marks. You know, how on earth could a book that's supposed to be written or claims to have been written by this man Daniel while in exile in, in Babylon, how on earth can it be taken seriously and as, as a credible historical narrative when all of the evidence points to it being written in the second century BCE, three to four hundred years after the events that it describes? And this again is not only a noted Bible scholar, but a noted Bible scholar who is a believer. Now, with that in mind, I want to show you the following clip from my conversation with Dr. Richard Carrier. Um, I'm wondering whether you could, again, for the benefit of my audience, just list off some of the things that the book of Daniel gets wrong about, about that part of history. Oh, gosh, there's so many. Uh <laughs> Uh, it gets some of the the timing of when Nebuchadnezzar uh, took Jerusalem. It gets that a little bit wrong. Um, mm. It's off by a few years and, and certain events. But um, more catastrophically is it says Belshazzar succeeded Nebuchadnezzar mm. and that Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Uh, none of those things is true. Uh, Belshazzar was the uh, son of Nabodonus and Nabodonus um, took the throne um, three kings later after Belshazzar. Belshazzar was, or three kings later after Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar was never king. He was, he was sometimes regent. Like sometimes he took charge of the empire when Nabodonus was always fighting campaigns, for example. But he was never king himself. Uh, he was, so he was not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He did not succeed Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, all these other guys did. We have Amal Marduk, uh, Nerik Lassar, uh, Labashi Marduk, and then Nabodonus. So there's like this whole sequence of rulers of Babylon uh, that Daniel has completely forgotten about. And so they've gotten the family connections wrong. They've gotten the sequence wrong. Uh, they're wrong even to claim that Belshazzar was a king. He never was. There was no Darius the Mede. Um, uh, so um, the sequence there is, it's, uh, the Medes were a big deal, but it turned out that the Persians were the ones that actually, the Medes were uh, basically a sub-tribe of the Persian Empire. So the, the Persians were the lead They weren't tribe. like, um, like a, uh, an ally of the, the, the way it's pitched by Jehovah's Witnesses and I guess many other Bible fundamentalists is that you have this group called the Medes and you have this group called the Persians and they all come together to fight together, you know? Right. And that isn't what happens. The right. Medes are actually subordinate to the Persians uh, or eventually become uh, by the time we're talking, by the time Jewish history connects with Persian history, the Medes are a tribe within the Persian empire. Mm. Uh, they aren't, they aren't any more elevated than any of the other tribes. It would be uh, like and, the Californians as opposed to the Americans. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it would be kind of like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So he, it's clear that the authors of Daniel are talking about Darius the Great, who, who is a particular great Persian leader that we know about. Uh, because the way they talk about the things that he did and stuff, they're, it's Darius the Great, right? So they, they've confused Darius. They've sort of created this Darius the Mede and out of Darius the Great. And I think, uh, and I do talk about this in the article, I and other scholars suspect that the authors of Daniel did this on purpose to fix another failed prophecy about how the Medes would dominate. Uh, and so in order to get that prophecy to work, they had to sort of fudge history a little bit and make Darius into a Mede. Because then that allowed them to uh, to basically sell it, uh, right? And so, so the, I think this isn't so much an error as a deliberate alteration of history to make it fit prophecy, right? So it's it's revisionist history. Uh, that's that's what we suspect, but mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, it's false, right? So it's it's erroneous. Um, but uh, the other thing is it depicts uh, Darius the Great as the Persian king who freed the Jews. Uh, actually, that was Cyrus the Great. Um, <clears throat> and they also get the, the order of things wrong. So um, Daniel says Darius was the son of Xerxes. In actual fact, that's Xerxes the Great. He was the son of Darius. Uh, Darius's father was Hystaspes, which isn't mentioned by Daniel. So Daniel gets family succession wrong a lot. It gets the order of if, uh, people wrong. It gets... Um, it gets who who is working for which kingdom wrong. It gets the sequence of rulers. It gets the the family relationships wrong. Um, so uh, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's it's clear that whoever's writing this is hundreds of years removed from what they're talking about, and they they're just kind of flying by the seat of their pants, kind of like coming up with something. They're not using like reliable historical records mm. to build this out. So quite damning, isn't it? Again, so many errors of a historical nature in a book that claims to be commenting on historical events. And yet the problem that writers of the book of Daniel had was that they were commenting on a period in history that was meticulously chronicled by the Neo-Babylonian peoples in myriad cuneiform tablets that specified precise details of what was happening and which ruler was in charge when a certain thing happened and you know what were the motions of the planets and the moon when these things happened so that we can centuries later use our computers and figure out precisely what date they're referring to so it was a a dodgy period for anyone to wade in and say, oh, yeah, this happened when it didn't really happen. And yet that's exactly the trap that the writers, the numerous writers of the book of Daniel fell into. They believed that they could pass this work, this book, off as being authentic and credible, as a credible historical narrative but they just got so many things wrong and if you want a more exhaustive list of these things i would advise you to look up dr carrier's excellent blog article how we know daniel is a forgery i will put a link in the description which brings us to our final example of historical inaccuracies in the bible and for this I must go to another YouTuber, another YouTube channel. It's actually someone who I consider a friend. He is a remarkably gifted YouTuber and thinker and speaker. I'm referring to Cosmic Skeptic, who not so long ago interviewed renowned Bible scholar Bart Ehrman and flagged a particular verse, a particularly problematic verse not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. Specifically, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, which says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So specifically mentioning there Quirinius 
as being governor of Syria when this decree, this census was enacted. Let's see what Dr. Bartirman has to say when asked about this. One historical contradiction of sorts that I find really fascinating is fascinating to me because it isn't a contradiction between Gospels, but rather a historical problem within one of the Gospels itself. And that is, uh, we've already mentioned this census, we, we mentioned it very briefly, but the, the story as to why uh, Jesus needs to travel uh, from Bethlehem, uh, from Nazareth up to Bethlehem, uh, why Joseph and Mary have to travel up to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus, is because of the census where Joseph, for some reason, has to go back to the sort of place of his lineage, and, and so he has to travel all the way up here. And this is said to happen, and, and it seems strange to me why this detail is even given. It seems it's it said that this happens while Quirinius is the governor of Syria. Yeah. Why, why is that specified, and, and, and why is that a problem? Well, it's specified because Luke, um, Luke especially, I'd say more than the other Gospels, wants to situate the things that happen in a real historical moment. And, you know, they don't have, they don't date things the way we do. So you can't say, you know, yeah, this was in the year, you know, 5 BCE. You know, they don't have calendars like that. And so they date things by who was ruling when. This is very common in the Roman world. You say, you know, this happened when so and so was the consul, you know, for the second time. It's how they date things, and so he's dating. He's dating this. He's saying this is during when the, the census that happened when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. But um, the problem is that Quirinius uh, became the governor of Syria uh, ten years after Herod the Great had died, and Luke is also specific that this happened during the reign of Herod the Great, and so he just didn't. You know, he didn't know. And you think, well, how could he not know? Well, okay. So 60 years ago was, uh, what, I guess it was uh, probably the 19, say in the 1970s. And suppose I say something about how, uh, you know, uh, you know, G George Schultz was the uh, Secretary of State when, uh, you know, Richard Nixon was the president. Um, well, that I don't think that's true. I don't know if that's true or not. See, I don't even know. I'm, and I've got a PhD <laughs> and, I, and I have newspapers and books and things. I, I don't think George Schultz was the president, the secretary of state until later, but like, you know, you kind of you associate people in your head. And so he's saying this thing about Quirinius and he's wrong. He, he couldn't have been, I mean, it's a contradiction with known facts. We know when Quirinius was the governor of Syria from a number of ancient sources that have no stake in the matter. Josephus just tells us when he was the governor of Syria. And it was, you know, after Herod the Great was dead for 10 years. So it seems the problem of Bible writers fabricating history and just making things up to sound plausible is not exclusive to the Old Testament. There's at least one example, and I haven't looked into this extensively. Again, this is just part one of what will very likely be a series of videos. And having had this brought to my attention, I obviously intend to go through the New Testament as well as the Old Testament with a tooth comb to see what else there is in terms of, you know, dodgy assertions about history. It, it's a really damning one again. I mean, it's just proof, isn't it, that it's not God's inspired, inerrant word. Because they should be getting this stuff right. I'm sorry, if it really is the word of God that's been passed down to human writers, this is the sort of detail that they should be getting right. And, and they just didn't. And it's so obviously an attempt to just impress the reader. Oh, we know what we're talking about. We, you know, we've done our research and this is the period when this happened. Turns out they were wrong. It is unquestionably a historical inaccuracy. So those are my eight examples for this part one of what again will be a series of videos. I don't know how long the series will be at this point. Maybe there'll just be one more episode. Maybe I'll end up drowning in examples and I'll need to do more than one extra episode. 
But in any case, I think this is really interesting information. And I, I really need to thank the Bible scholars featured in this video. All five of them, I guess six if we include Neil Asher Silberman, who helped with writing The Bible Unearthed. I really need to thank these people, you know, for putting in this legwork in terms of going to the trouble of explaining this. Because, you know, those of us who come from a fundamentalist background, we just take it as a given that the Bible is historically accurate. We just assume that to be the case. And how are we to know any different if there are if there is no Bible scholarship, if there are no people who are willing to devote decades and decades, their entire careers, to examining the documents, to examining the archaeological evidence, to getting their hands dirty, sifting through rubble and finding inscriptions. How are we to know any different if not for the efforts of these incredible people? And I guess the the reason why I'm most grateful to my patrons for requesting me to make this video is that, you know, these books, they're not like, I mean, you can buy them, obviously, I've bought them, but they're not cheap. I mean, they, they are reasonably priced, and each of the authors deserves every single penny they get in royalties. But my point is that whereas fundamentalist publications are in many cases free, if not they are, you know, just a, a very small amount of money, the, the books that really give you an important and educational insight on the realities of the Bible, they just take a bit of effort to get hold of, you know? And... I have a modest collection of these books. I intend to add to it. I, it's a subject that fascinates me, and I intend to keep researching this, and that will necessitate buying more books, some from the same writers, some from other Bible scholars, and, and just filling in the gaps in my knowledge. But my point is, you know, there's effort there. There's effort in the Bible scholars going to all of that, trouble to to fulfill their careers to to go through their education to to do the field work and then to bother to educate people in their books and and then there's the effort of people to actually go out and buy those books and and listen to the bible scholars i mean what the bible scholars do and the work they put in is meaningless if no one actually listens to them and no one reads their books, and no one's willing to learn from them. So I guess that's why I'm really grateful to my patrons and YouTube members for asking me to do this video. I hope you found it informative. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for similar videos. And as always, thank you for watching.